Hey nerds, Farmer Jesse here. In continuation of our crop breakdown series, let's get into a set of crops that is perhaps not our most profitable that we grow necessarily, but is among the more delicious and can add a little boost to our fall and winter sales, or at very least our fall and winter pantry, winter squash. We will talk varieties and spacing and curing and all that good stuff, so let's do it. Did you know all squash are related? Yeah, they're pumpkin. No, it doesn't get any better than that. That is literally the best joke in the whole video. All right, so winter squash. It's perfectly rational to wonder why people even grow these crops because on paper, it's not the most enticing. Uh, winter squashes, pluralizing something like that is really always feels ridiculous. But anyway, winter squashes tend to be very slow to grow. They take up a lot of space. They are low yielding. They have generally high nutrient needs and can be very pest and disease susceptible. So why bother? Uh, well, one, the flavors are really exciting and unique. A lot of winter squashes can be eaten raw in salads, in fact. Uh, it's true, it's great that way. They can be made into soups, roasted and stuffed into pastas, used as transportation for the local royal ball. Winter squash stores extraordinarily well, not to mention that some people certainly have a desire to grow great winter squash because it has an enormous amount of cultural and family significance, especially here in the United States, where it has been grown for thousands and thousands of years, uh, sustaining native populations through many winters. So there are a lot of different reasons to want to grow this particular type of crop and grow it well. And it can be done in a way that is not so labor, space, or tillage intensive, and thus maybe a little more profitable than a high tillage system. First, there are two main types of winter squashes, and you'll have to bear with me. Some Latin names are coming, and I will probably botch them. But they are important. The types are Cucurbita pepo, which tends to be like your acorn squashes, uh, delicatas, and pumpkins. These pepos, as they're often referred, are probably the most common. Then there are cucurbita muscata, which are like your butternuts and honey nuts. And finally, you have cucurbita maxima, which are like your kubocha squashes, but also some of those flatter pumpkin looking things. There are other squashes, but those are the main ones. And there's some crossover between them, so don't make assumptions here because maxima can be bred to look like a pepo and vice versa. And then the reason that Latin name is important is because it isn't that hard to save seeds on these types of squashes as long as you are not growing two of the same varieties, or at least not very close to one another. Um, we saved butternut squash seeds for years, and it was fun to pick and choose the attributes that we liked. So you can grow a Muscata, a Maxima, and a Pepo, and save the seeds on all three without fear of them crossing. Just keep in mind that most summer squashes are Pepos, so they can potentially cross with your winter squash. 800 feet to a half a mile is the recommendation in terms of isolation distance for squash, according to the Seed Savers Exchange website. Got a lot of great information over there. So spread uh, spread them out if you plan to save the seed. Another thing to keep in mind with squash is bush habit versus vining habit. Bush habit, sometimes just called short vining, uh, simply means that the squash are not going to vine out eight feet in every direction or more, uh, growing more like summer squash. For a lot of growers on small acreage, the bush habit varieties are extremely popular because you can keep them relatively confined to a single bed. Uh, that said, there are not that many choices for bush or semi-bush habit varieties. My favorite is Jester, which is more of a short vine, but then there are also things like Starry Night, Sweet Reba, and Honey Bear. There's also a bush variety of Delicata over at High Mowing Seeds that you can get a hold of, and you may be able to find a couple shorter vine varieties of spaghetti squash out there as well. Most of the pumpkins and butternuts are long vines, though sometimes you may be able to find medium vining varieties. Kitty Cat. Yeah, it's been a while, Kitty. She's still around, she just, she's lazy. Choosing your varieties for winter squash can be very personal, but if you're growing these for market, try to avoid anything, or at least investing too much into things that are going to be hard to explain or sell. Uh, for us, we do honey nuts and delicatas the spaghetti and some winter luxury pie pumpkins. And I don't generally save the seeds because there are three of those or pepos or hybrid. Anyway, 
Choose your seed according to the aforementioned qualities, and just keep in mind that winter squashes average between 80 and 120 days to maturity, so you will need a very long growing season to grow them. Pick a shorter day to maturity squash in cooler regions and plant them early. Uh, I like starting them in the greenhouse in individual blocks so that the roots aren't touching. More on that in a minute. Our season is long enough here in Kentucky Zone 6B to follow our garlic that comes out in early July with the winter squash, but it's definitely pushing it. Most regions anywhere near north of us probably can't do that. And because it's pushing it, we actually transplant our squash instead of directly seeding it. Basically, the garlic comes out. We mow any weeds, we mulch, and then we dig holes and use larger transplants instead of directly seeding it. Now, a lot of people prefer to directly seed their squash because the roots on cucurbits are extremely sensitive. So you don't want them touching like in blocks or cell trays. Any jostling at all at transplant time can damage or even kill the plant. Um, that said, it can be done. We do it with all of our squash and have for a decade now. How we do squash plants though, is that we usually do something like two inch soil blocks or wind strips, and then we separate them to keep them uh, get roughly 18 or so per tray. Um, by separate, I just mean the blocks aren't touching. You just don't want them to touch so you're not pulling them apart when you plant them. Like I said, you can also do this with wind strip trays, which would be faster, but the risk of root damage is slightly higher in my experience. And you bottom water wind strip trays just to keep them moist because oftentimes the bottoms will dry out. Anyway, that won't help your production if they dry out. Okay, start the seeds about two, two and a half weeks before you intend to transplant them at least. Um, if you're direct seeding, just put the seeds in the beds when they're ready. You can uh, prime them as described in this video, which is a good way of inoculating them and just getting them ready to germinate. Quick pro tip, you know how the best squash you will ever get grows right out of your compost pile? It's true though. Well, I say take the hint and add a nice handful of good compost to each of your seed or transplant holes. Uh, it makes an enormous difference in disease and pest resistance. Uh, I'm serious, that's the trick to winter squash. It's really not that complicated. Nothing fancy, just a really nice finished compost right around the plant. And you shouldn't have any huge disease issues as long as you're doing that. And as long as you're planting them into relatively warm soil. Now for spacing, my spacing is a little tighter than some, but the rule of thumb here is that if you are planning to irrigate, you can get a little bit tighter in your spacing. If not, you will want to go wider out. For basically any squash plant, but especially winter squash, um, three feet apart is about as close as you want to plant them. I will plant two rows staggered on a 48 inch bed with each plant three feet apart in a row, and you will plant the metric below so that other friends in any other logical country can follow. If you're dry farming, get closer to four to five feet apart, just so the water needs aren't as intense. Uh, now, obviously weeds are going to be a huge issue with vining crops because they'll just come up through the vines. So I recommend mulching if you possibly can, especially if dry farming. Generally mulch after you plant because mulching before can be a bit of a pain, but honestly, neither one is particularly fun. So just mulch in whatever way makes sense for you. If you can't mulch, just expect to do some really well-timed cultivations and nip every possible weed you can in the bud because after about three weeks, you cannot be walking around in those vines and picking weeds. It will hurt your yield. Now, if you have decent soil and you added that little bit of good compost, uh, you should not have terrible pest and disease issues. If you have really poor soil and, and you generally have things like squash bugs and vine borer issues, cover the plants with insect netting until they are flowering. Uh, at flowering, you have to remove the netting for pollination purposes, obviously. Um, during growth, just stay out of the patch as much as possible. Like I said, you don't want to step on those things. Perhaps, obviously, I do not grow vining crops like these or sweet potatoes where we have living pathways because that would just be a mess. Oh, for interplanting, you could plant corn in there as well with the squash. This is obviously inspired by the Three Sisters method of gardening uh, developed by indigenous Americans. We don't interplant the squash because we're already pushing the season so much by not planting our winter squash until July. So we need every ounce of sunlight for ours, but it is something you can do. For irrigation, drip irrigation is going to be ideal so as not to promote foliar diseases um, like overhead irrigation might. I don't have recommendations on how often to run your drip irrigation. Really, that will depend on climate and mulch and water access and so on. But what I will say is that squash is generally a shallow root crop, so don't let the first four inches get too dry. You really want that to stay pretty much moist throughout the season. Um, it should always feel somewhat moist, but just not mucky. Then once you have your plants established, it's just a waiting game. Uh, the plants will mature, then add flowers and slowly add fruit. 
do not harvest the fruit until the vines are entirely dead. If there is any green left on the fruit or any green left on the vines, uh, in our experience, they will still be okay to eat, but not great to store. Some squash can take a light frost, but preferably they are all out before the frost begin. For harvest, one person goes through with long handled clippers and cuts the stem at the vine, leaving some of the stem behind, but also some of the stem on the squash because it looks nice. And after they're cut, another person comes through and picks up all the squash. Important note here, I like those long handled loppers just so it's not to destroy your back. We then move the squash to our wash pack shed where we lay it out on trays to cure. First, the reason we cure squash is to heal wounds on the squash, to thicken the skin, and convert some of its starches into stable sugars. Now, not every squash has to be cured, and the ones that do, do not necessarily cure at the same speed. Some pumpkins and delicata don't need much, if any, curing, but they also don't store all that long, that long just being a couple to a few months after harvest. Acorns and spaghetti squash are the same and are not supposed to be cured at all, and likewise will store only for a few months. Butternuts and honey nuts, on the other hand, can take several weeks to fully cure, but can store all the way until you plant again next year. You really have to treat each squash individually, but the general rule is that the longer the squash takes to cure, the longer it will store. For the squashes that do not need curing, store them somewhere cool, like, a, I don't know, a dry basement or a cooler part of your house or farm. Uh, for the ones that need curing, you will want to find a warm place with pretty high humidity and good ventilation. The temperature should be roughly 80 degrees Fahrenheit or roughly 27 degrees Celsius. If you do not have good natural humidity like we do here in Kentucky, zone 6B, birthplace of humidity, you don't need to fact check, I'm pretty sure that one's true. If you do not have good natural humidity, then you will want to throw some breathable cover over top of the squash in a bucket of water or a pan of water or something underneath. That will help with the curing. We just do single layers of squash on these little chicken wire racks that you can see. And then we find a way to elevate those. So in this case, they're just stacked between other little stainless steel racks. Um, it's not super easy to explain, but basically the idea is to have airflow above and below the squash to avoid rot without filling every tabletop in the world with squash. Uh, for a little airflow, we have a couple fans on low speed, just blowing air at the squash, but not necessarily trying to dry them out. Again, that humidity is important. Then after they're cured, we move them to a place where the temps are closer to cellar temperatures. Uh, you do not want it to get too cold or too warm, or they may not last. They'll rot or they'll freeze or whatever. Refrigerators or coolers are probably a little too cold in general. Room temp is generally a little too warm. Basements are good or near a door or in a colder closet. Uh, if they get frozen, the squash will rot, so keep them from freezing, obviously. Market or eat your more perishable squashes first, then move on to the longer storage ones. Otherwise, I think that's about it. Is that about it? I think that's about it. Feel free to add your two cents in the comment section. Uh, what did I get right? Wrong? What did I miss? Um, what are your favorite squashes? Sign up to be a patron if you appreciate these little crop breakdowns at patreon.com slash no-till growers. Pick up a hat or a copy of the Living Soil Handbook at notillgrowers.com. That supports these videos as well. If you are not subscribed to this channel, make sure to hit the subscribe button. And if you are subscribed, you're awesome. Like this video if you like this video. Thanks for watching. We'll see you later. Bye.